I just want to thank everyone for uh, keeping Diana in your prayers. Um, she arrived in India safely, praise the Lord. She said to me on the way out of this, she just really felt the favour of God uh, upon the whole trip. Um, you know, every security gate she had to go through, or any changing of planes, or anything that she had to go through, it was just very easy and, and everything just went to plan. She got there safely. She stayed in an amazing hotel, which <laughs> she showed me. Um, everything's going well. She's had her first procedure um, and she's just waiting um, for the next one. But uh, keep her in your prayers. Um, she won't be back until the 13th of March, so keep her in your prayers. Um, thank you for keeping me in your prayers. I have uh, phone calls from uh, brothers here and uh, other people just calling me and sisters in, in this group just calling to see that I was okay. Uh, thank you for uh, reaching out to me. And um, it always means a lot, you know, it's not just, you know, like this is a family to me, you guys are family, you know, the family of God, and, and I really appreciate that, and I'm sure that the other appreciates all your prayers that you guys have lifted up. Yeah. Now, next week, everyone say next week. Next week. Next week, we'll have Pastor Jonathan Downs teaching here next week and preaching, so please make a special effort to be here. Um, he always brings a powerful word, as you guys know. So I don't want you guys to miss out on that, so make a special effort to be here. Um, and to next week, sorry, the 10th of uh, March, will be our soup kitchen again, 6 o'clock in Groomer Place. Uh, so that will be next week. Um, I was just going to ask if um, anyone can be here next week with Theo to just help set up, because I'll be going to get all the bread for the soup kitchen. So next week, um, to be here a bit earlier, to help, help set up all the chairs, food and things like that because by the time I go from Dungarland and pick up all the bread and bring it back and all that, it's, I would normally get here at 6.30, so if anyone can be here. Someone else can pick up the, the bread. <laughs> someone else can pick up, yeah, and all the supplies. Oh, I'm happy to pick it all up, but I just need someone to come in and help us set up all the chairs and the food and all that. I know Jess that you're helping out with the food for next week as well. So yeah, if you can be here any earlier, Christian, you can help with the chairs. They're all around the corner in the storeroom. Theo knows where everything is, so he can just um, direct everyone what they need to do. So thank you for that. Uh, yeah, normally here by six. Yeah, quarter to six, six o'clock. There is normally the first one in. Okay. And the last one to do. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, there. Actually, put your hands together for Theo. He does an amazing job every week, he's always serving and I think last week was his highlight, being all on that digital board and all the lighting and everything like that, he was like, whoa. That was overkill. <laughs> overkill, <laughs> overkill, yeah. But as you guys know, each week we always take up an offering um, for this ministry and I thank you guys that you guys always support us. We can't do what we do without you guys supporting us, you know. Um, ministries run on people such as us that we actually sow into the kingdom of God so God can reach out to more and more people. And it's amazing what he has been doing and what he will be doing. And still, the best is yet to come. Amen. So in uh, First uh, Chronicles 16, 29, it says, Give to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Amen? Amen? So we are all called to give into his kingdom, to sow into his kingdom. And, you know, as I always say week after week, we are blessed to be a blessing unto others who are doing it tough. And, you know, when we take up our collection, yes, we cover the cost of what we do here each week, but it got, what we want is it for it to go outside of these four walls to reach people that Jesus wants to reach. Amen. So I was just going to ask uh, if someone, I might get, oh, Daisy, you've got to play the food there. <laughs> Daisy, will you come up and please pray for the offering tonight? Jesus for your provision. We thank you, Father, for bringing us together to hear your word. We thank you, Father, for every um, amount that is going to be given today. Father, I pray that it will be used for the fragrance of your kingdom and the yes. people that receive it will be impacted not only by the finances but by the knowledge of who you are and 
May you replenish the pockets that give and those that don't have, Father, may you provide for them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Awesome. Now, I just want to remind people who give electronically and you guys do it into the BSB account number, which is up on the, on the screen there, please make sure you put Vardos Missions in the reference field if you do that. Um, or otherwise we don't know where the money's being allocated to. And because uh, it's not just a single account that goes into the church account and then they divide it to where it needs to go. So please put Vardos Missions. If anyone's wondering, what's Vardos? That's my surname. <laughs> so Vardos Missions. Um, so yeah, if you put that in the reference field, we'll know where the funds are being allocated to. Something that I wanted to bring to the group um, every week, I know that the Lord speaks to all of us. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah. And, you know, the last few weeks we've had Tess bring a word to us. Uh, and I really want to encourage each and every one of us here that comes here regularly, that if the Lord puts a word on your heart during the week, you know when God speaks to you and you know that that is from the Lord, it could be a personal word for you, but it also could be a personal word for the group to encourage someone else. So tonight I just wanted to just open it up and ask, has anyone heard from the Lord or is there something that you'd like to share uh, to the group? Um, has anyone got anything? You don't have to bring it up this time, but I want you guys to be active. I want you guys to bring what the Lord brings to you. Yeah? The Word of God is meant to be shared. It's encouraging. Yeah? Mm -hmm. oh, I appreciate it. Everyone, clap your hands. Last night I was lying in bed and uh, the Lord said to me that um, it's more important for you to realize that I'm real and exist than it is for you to have my help. Amen. So I just want to share that with you. Amen. That's right. Amen. 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 That's right. We need to know who he is and that he exists because all things come from him. Without him, there's nothing. Amen. And uh, I was actually, uh, I had something that I was going to share with you guys, just a little word of encouragement. And it was, uh, someone was speaking to, like on, a, um, like on a podcast, and they were saying, you have Christians who go to church, who are in the church, and then you have Christians who are in Christ. Did you get that? There are Christians that are in the church, but there are Christians who are in Christ. I want to be found in Christ. Amen? You don't want to be just going to a building week after week, okay, and not being who God has called you to be. And to, and to know Him, but to really know Him, of them to really know Him. Can I say something? Yes, yes, brother, come up, often. We need to know Him intimately. I was reading what yes. you just about to say this morning. Yes, to know Him. Yes. In Ephesians chapter four. Amen. Yes. yes. And it, and the apostle Paul was writing to the Ephesians, and he said to them that I might know Him in the power of his resurrection. Amen. That I might know him. And then, and then I, I, I realized, Apostle Paul, he had revelations. He, 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 was, he was God in, in the third heaven. He had uh, experience with God, left and right and center. Yes. He, he was so close to God. And still, he wanted to know him in his resurrection. Amen. We only just, just, just touched the surface of, of uh, of, of Jesus, yes. we don't know. We don't really know Him. There is more to know Him. There is more power. There is more glory. There is more, more of Him. Hallelujah. There is no just, 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 just we just, we just touching the surface. But there is more of that. There is more power to know Him, to know Him, and that's what God wants us to do. What Jesus wants us 
to love him more and more every day. Amen. The more we pray, the more we love him, the more he's going to reveal unto us mm -hmm. who he is and the power of his resurrection. Yeah. Thank you. Praise the Lord. That's right. God always wants to reveal more and more of himself and we just need to be close to him. We need to seek him, you know, with all our heart. Praise God. Now, last week we did receive an awesome word that Diana left us with. And, you know, the, the last week was all about the promises of God. And God is not a man that he should lie. He's God Almighty and his promises are yes and amen. Amen? amen. All right, if you guys have got your Bibles, let's turn to James chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. Some of you might have digital Bibles, some of you have got the old paper Bible. It's always good to have God's Word with us, always. Amen? Amen. So James chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed. By the wind. For not let so for not for let not sorry that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Tonight the Lord has put on my heart to speak to us all, even myself. This word came from his throne about having unshakable and unwavering faith. Everybody say unshakable, unshakable. unwavering, unwavering faith. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that we are here tonight to dig into your word, Lord. And Lord, we are open to hear what you have to say to us. Lord, let faith arise in this place that we will go from glory to glory and strength to strength. Lord, without faith, it, it is impossible to please you. So every single person that is here, that is listening, even online, Lord Jesus, let our faith go to a new level in you, Lord, so that we can do what you have called us to do. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone says amen. 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 So faith... What is faith? Well, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, so chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That is what faith is. This is why the Lord questioned his disciples when they were in the boat and it was filling with water. Does everyone remember that scene? And that's found in Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. And he rebuked the winds and the sea, and he said, Peace, be still. And there was a great calm on the sea. Then Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now, the disciples may have had some faith. Yeah, they were walking with Jesus. I'm sure they would have had some faith. But they did not have faith in the situation that they were facing. And that is prophetic for someone here tonight. You might have faith the things that you had in the past or gone through in the past. But sometimes we come to a different situation and a different circumstance in our life. And then we're like, where are you, Lord? Where is our faith in those moments? Because we all go through storms in life. Has everyone been through a storm? I think every hand should be raised in this house. And if not, then we all need to repent because we're lying. <laughs> life is full of storms. And when situations and circumstances come up against us, we also cry out like the disciples did and say, Lord, 
Don't you care that we are perishing? But the Lord is asking a question to us here tonight. Where is your faith? Where is your unshakable faith? And where is your unwavering faith? Amen? When I think about unshakable and unwavering faith, I look at David and Goliath. David was a young shepherd boy, and his father Jesse tells David, take some supplies to your older brothers who are in the battle with the Philistines and bring back report to me of how they are doing. So David, he rocks up on the scene. And in 1 Samuel chapter 17, 8 to 11, before we get into that scripture, I just want to explain to you what David was seeing before him. You see, Goliath was a huge giant. The Bible describes him as six cubits and a span tall. In our modern day scaling, if you wanted to put that into how tall was he for us today? Nine foot nine. Do you guys know that when you see a basketball ring in the official basketball stadiums when you go to a basketball ring, they are 10 foot. Goliath was seven and a half centimeters shorter than the ring. He was a giant. He had, bronze, he had a bronze helmet and a chain coat of mail that weighed 5,000 shackles of bronze. So I had to do some research for this lesson and I found out that those 5,000 shackles of bronze would weigh 57 kilos for us today. That is a heavy vest of chain for the battle. He had bronze armor around his legs and he had a bronze javelin between his shoulders. And the staff of his beam, of the spear, was a weaved beam. And the head, the iron head for the spear, that weighed 600 shackles. And that, in today's terminology, would be 6.84 kilos, was just the spearhead. He was huge and he was equipped for battle. But in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to pick up our text here, verse 8 to 11. Is that right? Yes. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight. When Saul and the army of Israel, all of Israel, heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You see, when the enemy in our lives starts intimidating us and making threats against you, I want all of us to stand with unshakable faith and with unwavering faith, just like David did. Amen? David had two questions that he rose up. What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? And then he said this, for who is this, uncir who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So David says, what do I get? Two things. What do I get for taking the reproach away from Israel? And who does this giant think he is? You see, Israel had a covenant with the living God. They were circumcised and that meant that they were in covenant with God. A covenant is a relationship between two partners who make binding promises to each other. 
and to work together to reach a common goal. That's what it means to be in covenant with someone. And when we realise that we too, all of us here, are in covenant with the Lord, we can look at our giants and say, who are you? To threaten and intimidate me. Do you know who I am? I'm a child of the living God. Amen? And that's why in Isaiah 54, 17, it says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me. Thus says the Lord. Amen? Because we have a God who's in covenant with us. We learned last week that He is a promise keeper. God is not a man to lie. And He is with us and He is for you and not against you. Because we have a God who keeps His promises. It doesn't matter about the situation that you're in right now and it doesn't matter about what circumstances you're facing. We have a God who is for us and not against us. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. David then tells Saul that he will go and fight with Goliath. So in 1 Samuel 17, 33, it says, And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. And this is a prophetic statement I'm making to all of us here tonight. I'm telling you not to listen to man. But have faith in God. Amen. 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 Don't listen to man. Have faith in God. Maybe man told you that this situation will never change. Maybe the doctor has given you a report and said this is for life. Maybe your partner said that it's all over. Maybe your child has turned away from the Lord. But I want to remind us all that we serve a God that, that says that with men things are impossible, but with God all things are possible. Amen? Amen. Amen? We serve a God who is supernatural. We serve a God who can do abundantly more than what we can ask or even think or imagine. God is on our side. Come on, God is on our side. Who has faith to believe that God can do the impossible? Amen? Amen? So David said to Saul, God has delivered me from the lion and the bear, and he will deliver me from the hand of, the Philist of this Philistine. And Saul said to him, Okay, go, and the Lord be with you. Now, when the scripture reference for this one is a longer passage, so if you've got your Bibles, follow along with me. So 1 Samuel 17, 38 to 51. So Saul clothed David with his armour, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armour, and he tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. And here is another warning for anyone that can hear this in the spiritual realm. Don't let other people put things on you. Don't let other people put things on you, even if it seems that they are trying to help. Okay? Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And he placed them in his shepherd's bag, in the pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began to draw near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. 
for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Can you imagine the scene? David rocks up with a stick in his hand, a sling. And Goliath looks at him and says, Are we going to play fetch? You think I'm a dog that we're going to play fetch now? That's what he says to him. He says, Am I a dog? You come to me with sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David turned around and said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and with javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied me. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you, and I'll take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcass to the camp of the Philistines, and to the birds of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth. And all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So whose battle is it? Lord's. The Lord's battle. I'm glad you guys are listening and you can hear what the Lord is saying tonight. It is the Lord's battle. It belongs to him. David had three things that he took with him into the battle. Number one, he took unshakable and unwavering faith with the Lord. And he had that faith because of the covenant that he had with him. He had the promise. They both had a common goal together. Number two, he took the Lord, the rock, into the battle. How many scriptures we see in, 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 the, in the Bible about the Lord being the rock. He is the rock of all ages, amen? But he takes the five smooth stones. And the number five, for those of you who may not be aware, that five is a numerical number for grace. It means the grace of God, and grace is the empowerment of God. And number three, he came in the name of the Lord. He didn't come in his own name, he came in the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. We'll continue reading verse 48. So it was when the Philistine arose and came near to draw near to meet David, that David hurried and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and he took a stone and he swung it and he struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the rock sunk into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and he struck the Philistine and killed him. But he was with no sword in his hand. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine and he took his sword, so he takes Goliath's sword, and he drew it out from the sleeve and he killed him and he cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And that is what happens even with us in a spiritual realm. When we take up the sword of the Spirit, we cut down every lie of the enemy. We cut off the enemy's head. A lot of the stories in the Bible are physical stories that we read about, but they have spiritual implications and applications to us. Goliath was one of the many giants that Israel had to defeat before they came into the Promised Land. And we too face our own giants in life. Some situations in life may be physical and others may be spiritual. And we need to discern what each one is and have unshakable and unwavering faith for each situation that we're in. Amen? Don't be like Doubting Thomas. Does everyone remember Doubting Thomas out of all the disciples? There was one. And he said, I won't believe unless I see it with my own eyes. 
So this is found in John chapter 20, verse 24 to 29. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So this is the scene uh, just in the Gospels where Jesus appeared to all of the disciples. But Thomas, he was nowhere to be found in this, in the first time that he appeared, the Lord. And the other disciples um, therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. Can you imagine how excited they would have been? This was straight after the resurrection. They're up in the, in the room praying and then all of a sudden Jesus is in their midst. Okay, so they're excited that he is resurrected and he is Lord of all. So he said to them, so this is what Thomas said to, to the disciples, but they said, we have seen the Lord. And so he said to them, unless I, have, I see his hands, the print of the nails, and I put my fingers into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them, so this time Thomas is with them, and Jesus came, the doors being shut, and he stood in their midst, and he said, Peace to you. I don't know about you guys, but I'd be pretty scared if you're like, in a prayer meeting, and Jesus just turns up, all the doors are closed, and he's there in the midst. Amen? But he says, Peace to you. And he said to Thomas, because he knew what had happened, so he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it in my side. And he said, do not be unbelieving, but believe. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Amen. You see, Thomas didn't have the text that we had before in Hebrews <coughs> chapter 11, 1, where it said, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He didn't have that. He didn't understand that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. That's in Romans 10, 7. And the Bible tells us that we all have a measure of faith. We all have a measure of faith, and that's found in Romans 12, 3. And it is a gift of God. The faith that we receive is a gift from God. Amen? But we need to get to a point, all of us, including myself, that we believe in God more than what we believe in ourselves. Let me say that again. We need to get to a point where we believe God more than we believe in ourselves. You see, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it's known as the faith chapter in the Bible. And it speaks about Abel and his offering being a more excellent sacrifice than Cain's. And that though he is dead, it still speaks to us today. Because Abel, he gave his offering and it was a faith offering. Amen? It was done by faith. It also speaks about Enoch being taken away by God and not seeing death because he pleased God. He had faith in God. It speaks about Noah being divinely warned of the things uh, not even seen yet. So Noah hadn't even seen rain, but he believed that the Lord was telling him to build the ark. And he moved with God in fear and he saved his whole family. Amen. It speaks about Abraham uh, going out when he didn't even know where he was going. You know when you read about Abraham's account, it says, early the next morning, God said to him, take your only son, Isaac, and sacrifice him. Abraham's waiting for 20 years for that promise to come to pass. The Bible says the very next day, he got up, took his son, got the, the donkey, got the, the wood, and went. He didn't even know where he was going. He went on a three-day journey without even knowing he had faith. Amen? And what about his wife, Sarah? She conceived at a very old age. And then they received the promise because Abraham was to be the father of many nations. Innumerable as the sand by the seashore is what the Bible says. They all put their faith in God and God will provide. God will make a way where there is no way for each and every one of us 
any circumstance, any situation. I want faith to rise tonight in each and every one of us because God is a supernatural God. Amen. I've got a testimony to share with you guys. Some of you know about this situation that we went through 10 years ago. And, um, you know, I've been through my fair share of trials and my walk with the Lord, definitely. And, um, you know, there's, there's always challenges that, that we go through. But I've always been a believer that God is bigger and stronger than any situation that I've ever been in. But one of the most challenging and testing times in my life came when our third child, Aviana, was um, very sick. She was only six weeks old at the time when she was taken into hospital for having a fever over 38.5 degrees. I remember at the time that Peter and uh, Tali, they were both sick, so Diana took them to the doctors and uh, the doctor said to them, you know, they, they, got, a, they got a virus and um, if your little one he looked at her and said, if your little one, because she was only six weeks old, Diana had her in her arms. And she said, he said to her, if your little one gets a temperature over 35.8, you need to take it straight to the hospital. And Diana was like, okay. So uh, over a couple of days, um, yeah, her fever started coming up. You know, being six weeks old, Diana said that it went to 38, over 38.5. And we went, yes, we went straight into the uh, hospital. I was just going to get that, you know. Yeah, I'll just leave it there, there. All right. I'll, I'll click it because I just want to show people what we've seen when we went through all this. So Diana took her, they ran some tests at um, Calgary Hospital, and um, most of the tests came back and they said, oh, she's going to be all right. Every test has come back, not too bad. Um, there is one more test that we're doing, but you guys can go home. There's no point waiting around. Um, if there's anything that, we, uh, that we're alerted about, we'll contact you guys, but she seems good. Just go home, give her some Panadol, run some cold baths, because that will get her temperature down. And so off we went. And uh, as soon as we got home from the hospital, the hospital rang. And they said the last test just came in. And uh, unfortunately, your daughter has RSD in her lungs, and you need to take her straight into the Canberra Hospital. And there is a team waiting for you there. So we rushed straight into the hospital, and um, they said, "Look, we'll keep Diana and the little one in overnight for observation." And um, so I left them there after spending many hours with them. I said, "All right, I'll go home." But the next morning. I wanted um, to be there with Diana, but I had to wait for my in-laws to come over to look after Peter and Tali at the time, which Tali would have been about three and Peter was only six, so waiting for my in-laws. Diana gave me a whole list of things to bring to the hospital, and uh, so I grabbed everything that I needed to. But she said to me one thing on the phone, she said, hey babe, she goes, when you come to the hospital, the room that you left us in, I might not be in that room, because they're, they're talking about moving into another room. And I said, oh, okay, that's fine. So I arrived at the hospital and um, I walked into the room that, that I last, last left them in. And when I walked in, there was a whole heap of nurses and a whole heap of doctors in that room. And I couldn't see the army because there was just so many people in one room. And I thought, oh, they're not even in there. I can't see them. They must have moved them. So I went over to the reception desk and I spoke to, the, um, to one of the nurses there. And she said to me, um, when I went over and I asked for the name, she said, are you the father? And I said, yes. Now at that time when I said yes, a code blue sounded in the background. A massive siren went off. I've never seen that many doctors and nurses all run into one room. And it was the room that Diana and that were in. I couldn't see them because the doctors were already in there. I dropped everything that I was carrying and I ran into the room to see Diana curled in a little ball in the corner. She was crying and saying, Lord, save her. Jesus, save her. And we both lifted our hands in that corner 
And we started crying out to the Lord with tears running down our faces. They quickly took her out of the room, pumping oxygen with a little hand pump in their hand as we followed them down the corridor. They took her into a room and they asked us to wait outside for them to put her on the life support machine. The doctors came in and said, we have a helicopter on its way from Sydney and it will arrive for you, for you shortly and it's going to take you both to Westmead Hospital. We were both in shock. We were both in shock and we both began to pray and just ask God to intervene. Then they took us into the room and this was the first thing that we saw. They took us both into the room and they told us that one of the head nurses came there and she was the head pediatrician, is that how you say it? Little babies and she said, I'll be um, I'm assigned to this, this, um, this baby, so I'll be looking after you. And I'm the one who will be calling in, I'm calling all our nurses on duty. She goes, one good thing I can tell you right now is that we've cancelled the helicopter. Um, there's been a change of um, circumstances. We had two twin babies at Calvary Hospital and one of them needed this life support machine. But for some reason, she goes, um, that baby has stabilised and they, there's no need uh, for Aviana to go anywhere now. So we've cancelled the helicopter. And that was just such a relief to still be in Canberra where all that support was. Yeah, like we had people from church and um, our family and everyone supporting us. And it was important for us to stay here. So God made a way there. And I remembered uh, Pastor Jonathan's parents, both Sue and John, they came into the room and we laid hands on her and we prayed. And Jonathan's mum turned around to me and she said, Bill, you need to take a photo of this because this is going to be God's testimony for others. And I remember thinking, oh, what if he doesn't? What if he doesn't? And I had these, those thoughts come up in your head, don't they guys? Like, what if God doesn't come through? And then I've got all these photos of my little one that I'm going to have to be reminded of. But I stepped out of faith because I knew that God was bigger than our situation. Amen. And I remember the nurses. And they said to us, there's not really much you guys can do here. And it's best that you guys go home. And we said to him, then, I said to him, there's no way that I'm going to go home. There's no way I'm leaving this hospital without our baby. I'll sleep on the floor if I had to. And then they said to us, okay, well, why don't you just go to the Ronald McDonald house because they sometimes have rooms, but there is a requirement to stay there and you need to live 50 kilometres out of Canberra. Now, we only lived in Gundalan, which wasn't 50 kilometres. But we went and asked them. God softened their hearts and they said, look, you're not in, in the catchment area to stay in the hospital, but we do have a room for you too. So we got a room by, by the glory of God. He gave us a place to stay. And I remember the first night that we stayed in that room, it was, I think, a little bit after 12 o'clock by the time we went back to, to the room to try to get some sleep. It was really hard to try to sleep when you know your baby's on a life support machine. And, but I remember me and Yana walking into the room and saying, we're going to pray. And I remember hearing a pastor just before that event even happened. And he said, in his sermon, he goes, God is not deaf. We don't need to pray with heavy prayers. God hears our voice. And I said to Diana, we need to just pray once. And the rest of the time that we're here, we're going to praise him for the victory. Yes. Amen. Amen. So we prayed once and then we started praising him. I remember that first night that we were in that room at about 3 a.m. in the morning, we copped a phone call. And it was a very abrupt lady just saying to us, you need to get down here now, ASAP, and hung up on us. 
The only problem was we were staying on the other side of the hospital and there's so, I don't know if you guys know much about hospitals, but there's so many different security doors that they close up at night time that you can't go from one section to the other. So we just started running down the corridor and we get to our first door and it was closed and it was locked with a magnet. You couldn't push the door open, we like bang on the door and we couldn't open it. And I thought, now what? How are we going to get around there? But all of a sudden the security guard rocked up and he opened the door and he said, where are you guys going? We told him the situation and he goes, I can get you through these next few doors. So he got us through about three or four doors from memory and got us to a certain part of the hospital. He said, I don't have access now for the rest of it. So when you get down that corridor, he goes, I don't know how you're going to get through that door because I can only get to this part. It was all that side, was all a new section. Anyway, we went down to that, that door. Guess what? Someone opened the door just at that time. So we got to the corridor where Aviana was staying. And I remember seeing from the end of the corridor, we could see all the way to where her room was. Now her room, every time that we went into her room, we had to wear a mask, we had to wear um, one of those um, hospital gowns. So there was an airlock space between the corridor before you get into the room and then her room. So every time we went in, we had to be geared up. We couldn't just walk into the room. They couldn't leave the doors just open. Uh, all these procedures that they had in place. But when we looked down the corridor, I remember just seeing three wardsmen all standing, doors flung open. And we ran, and doctors were everywhere too, and we ran down the corridor. And I remember running into the room, Diana just collapsed on the floor and cried out, Is she dead? And uh, the lady that was the head doctor, she had come in, because this was like prayer in the morning. She came in because they were having complications and she said, no, who told you that? And we just said, look, we are just told to get down here ASAP. We just thought the worst. But uh, she said, no, but we did have some very serious complications because she had a tube that was down her throat doing all the breathing for her. That clogged up and they had to take it out to put a new one in because all the lens and the secretions were coming up and blocking the tube so she couldn't breathe. But the problem with that was, you could imagine on a six week old baby trying to get a tube down, down their throat, which is about you know the size of a five cent coin, into a little baby and all inside is just inflamed. So they couldn't, they were having very big difficulty trying to get the tube down to get any oxygen to her. And I remember her looking at us and she said, if this happens again, we can't do anything more. Which was really tough to hear. But the next day, we had a, um, a meeting with another doctor. You know, this doctor was a specialist that dealt with RSD. And um, we went into his office and he said, I'm just going to be really honest with you guys. You know, I've been practicing at this hospital for 15 years. He goes, I've never seen a case more worse than this. Not in a six month old and he put on the, on the screen all the x-rays that you could see the lungs and they were just filled. There was no area, you could see all this gray area. He goes, that's all her lungs. There's nothing in there that's clear that we can see. And we turned around and we said to him, yeah, we, we understand that this is the worst case, but we believe in God. We believe that Jesus is going to heal her. And I remember, uh, you know, being in, um, being in the room and, and all the nurses as well, you know, they, they'll just give you the bare minimum. They never give, they, don't, they never want to build up your hopes, right? They, they're just, they're there to do their job and, um, you know, we spoke to all of them about how Jesus can heal and that Jesus can save and Jesus can do miraculous things. And I remember even the nurses turning around and saying to us, you know what, we understand that you both have strong faith, but this is serious and it could be even, uh, you know, de detrimental that you might not go home with your child. You guys need to come to an understanding that this can happen. 
So I was trying to prepare us, but we just have faith. Everybody say faith. faith. And I remember that I was in her room and up and down the corridors every day singing praises to the Lord. Holding up the honor in my hands like that and singing to her. Singing worship songs to the Lord, singing praise songs to the Lord. Because it is our praise that prevails and gives us victory. Amen. Ah, 13 days she was in ICU. So that was nearly two weeks that she was in there. And I remember one morning we walked into the room and there was no tube in the throat. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And we asked the nurse, what happened? She said, you have a very strong one here. We didn't know how long to keep on this life support machine, but your daughter started pulling the tube out by herself. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> so the next 24 hours, they took her, the life support machine off her and they took her back into a room just for observation again. And they just had a little CPAP on her nose. And I remember that when Diana came into that room, this was what she had. She saw in the top corner, I don't know if you can see in that picture, what number is that right at the top? Of? God's grace. Amen. God's grace was there. And that was the first thing that Diana realized. Because God was always with us. And today, Aviana, she's a beautiful young girl and has no traces of RSV in the lungs whatsoever. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. And I think, yeah, that was, the, that was the last photo just before we took her out. <laughs> she did. Uh, Brother Bill, can I say something about that? Yes. I remember that very, very well. Come up here. Come up here. Because I've been in church for 45 years, I remember that very, very well that day. And the whole, well, I was playing, the whole church was playing with the girl. You know, and, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I remember Sister Sudan said, because she's a woman of faith. Mm -hmm. Sister Sudan, and she come up and said to us, that girl's going to leave because God spoke to me. And she's going to leave because the power of God is going to be there. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the power of God touched that girl. And today she's a very healthy girl. Hallelujah. We serve a mighty God. Amen. 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 We do serve a mighty God. A mighty God we serve. And I remember we took out some flowers to those nurses after a couple of weeks, after we got home, I think it was after the first week we had, we want to go back. Because all those nurses, they volunteered. They said, you know what? We'll come in even the, you know, the, the all night. Because they had to have someone there monitoring the life support machine. You couldn't just leave her there. There was someone had to be next to her bed the whole time. And they all took shifts to try to help um, Aviana. So we took some a card in there, we took some flowers in there, and I'll never forget what they said to us. You know what they said to us? She is the miracle baby. Amen. 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 The whole time we were there, we said, we have faith that she will be the miracle baby, and they saw our faith come to life. They saw Jesus firsthand. Amen. Amen. There will be times in our lives, guys, that we need to have unshakable and unwavering faith. And we can be in a situation like in Mark 9, 23 to 24. Jesus said to him, if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes. This is a man that had a demon-possessed son. Immediately the father said, so immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And sometimes we need to say that, guys. Sometimes we, we, we want to have unwavering faith and we want to have unshakable faith. But there will be situations in your life that you can have to say, Lord, help me with my unbelief. I know you can do all things 
but our faith level needs to come up. Amen. All through the Bible, Jesus um, always healed people. He always delivered people. And what would he say to them after when he would heal them or deliver them? He would always say to them, your faith has made you well. And in these last days, we all need to have unshakable and unwavering faith. Every single one of us. Faith that's, that will stand the test of time. Faith that believes in the impossible. Faith that knows that God is able. And faith that will step out in Jesus' name. Amen? Because greater is He that is in us than He that is in this world. Amen. That's the end of the lesson here tonight. But what I wanted to do, I, I did want to be pretty quick with the lesson because we haven't done this for a little while. And if, if you do need to leave because you've got kids and you've got school tomorrow, then please leave. But if you can stay back, we're going to do small groups. Tonight's a night where I want us to talk about our faith and strengthen one another because that's what we're all called to do. So I was just going to, uh, maybe we'll have uh, two groups or three groups. Does anyone need to leave? Just quickly. This is going to go for about 20 minutes. Does anyone need to leave? If not, Jerry, we can wrap that up. Everyone that's uh, online, we love you guys. We'll see you next week. Um, be blessed in the Lord. I hope your faith grows. And uh, we're going to get into our small groups. Praise God.